committee will come to order. Our next witness, Mr. Theoni Nang, uh, has a, a motto adopted from a quote by Marion Wright Edelman that service is what life is about. And uh, his unwavering commitment to bring change to communities uh, near and far, to people young and old and from across the world, even at his young age is remarkably uh, admired by many people. He has been a speaker uh, in local and national intergovernmental bodies. He's lectured uh, in Paris and many other places. He resides in Cleveland, Ohio, and we welcome him to this very important hearing at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just saying earlier that we cannot begin to solve the problems of global hunger and poverty without addressing the global water crisis. Uh, America has really done so much to help the world, and I want to personally thank the United States. I'm an example and testament to the dreams and hope that America represents. I grew to these conditions that everybody has described in West Africa, Senegal. Without nothing but hope in my heart and $20 in my pocket, I came to this country just eight years ago. Uh, now, eight years later, America has given me more than I ever expected. I'm thankful for that potential. I'm also thankful for the hope America gives to millions of people like myself who come here for the hope of freedom and democracy in action that pushes for the balance of justice in a pluralistic world. I have to tell you that there is millions of my brothers and sisters left in many parts of the world today as we speak without clean water or are dying now at this very, very moment. I know you can do something about that. I'm very sure that my dear country that I love so much can continue to save the lives of those who need us now. After all this personal story, this is a very, very personal story to me. Every day I get a bottle of water. I think of so many of the young people or just people in general out there without clean water or my own sister, the same mother and father that I lost in Senegal. Sometimes as you- Was it due to water, yeah. clean water? Exactly. Lack of clean water? Lack of clean water disease of diarrhea. I've watched my grandmother walking for miles every day, almost two miles, to get us water. And most of those water we used to drink are not clean. And in result of that, we lost our younger sister. So this is very, very personal to me. I was one of the lucky ones that made it to the United States. And I'm here today to speak on their behalf and for those who will never have the chance that I got to be in a great country like this where we take so much for granted, even this water we take for granted that people can't have just to drink it, let alone to take shower or sanitation that most of these people just talked about. So. No child should have to die because of lack of clean drinking water. We all agree on that. But I'll just ask you to think of your own children, grandchildren or your relatives. Imagine if they had no hope of clean drinking water, whether it is your child or my son Elijah here in the United States, all young Americans or millions of those poor children around the world, they all deserve a chance to follow their dreams. That should keep us going until the day for all of the world children counts and all their dreams can dance like beautiful raindrops on the chance floor of love and humanity. And Dr. Martin Luther King stated that injustice anywhere is threat to justice everywhere. And I thank you very much for this uh, 
the invitation to join you today, and I hope that you will continue to work hard to get your uh, colleagues to, 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 to help the uh, congressman, the chairman on this matter, because it's a very, very, very important matter around the world, as he just stated, that as we're speaking right now, there's millions of young people that are dying at this very, very moment, and we can really do something about that today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Paul Steimers is an attorney with K&L Gates, has been associated with water advocates, and has spent a, an incredible amount of his time raising awareness for the need for safe drinking water and sanitation uh, around the world. He helped pass the Water for the Poor Act of 2005. He was the senior editor of the uh, uh, Law and Pro Policy uh, Journal at Harvard Law School, a charter member of, the, uh, of that school's Association for Law and Policy at the Kennedy School of Government. And he's uh, inspired any number of people to volunteer their services and bring their skills to the understanding of the relationship of clean water to poverty in many places in, in the world. And we're honored that he could be with us today and recognize him at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Johnson, thank you for attending. The Water for the Poor Act, the Senator Paul Simon Water for the Poor Act in, uh, of 2005, created the framework by which the United States brings sustainable access to safe, clean drinking water and sanitation to the world's most poor. And since its passage, we have made a fair amount of progress. I should note that the passage of the Water for the Poor Act in 2005 was due in large part to one of your predecessors, Mr. Conyers, uh, Chairman Henry Hyde of uh, Illinois, who was both chairman of this committee and chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, it was his efforts in conjunction with those of Mr. Blumenauer uh, that were primarily responsible for passing this vital legislation through the House. Of course, Senator Frist and, uh, and Senator Durbin worked together in the Senate to make it happen as well. So you, you are part of a, uh, an important legacy here, and I thank you for your leadership. The current legislation is a response, as we have said, to the fact that the Water for the Poor Act has not been fully implemented yet. It is a response to the fact that America's aid agencies are moving in the right direction, but not fast enough. Uh, and that's not their fault, necessarily. Uh, it is a function of their lack of capacity in critical areas. And this bill attempts to address that and to give those agencies the, the capability that they need to reach people who need safe drinking water and sanitation effectively and efficiently. This bill is not about money. It is about spending the money that we spend more effectively, more efficiently, and to reach more people. It is about tracking how we spend the money and tracking the number of people that we provide with safe drinking water and sanitation for that money. It does not authorize the appropriation of funds. The current bill, like the previous bill, is bipartisan. As we've discussed, it passed the Senate by unanimous consent. It had 33 co-sponsors in the Senate, of which eight were Republicans. It has 97 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives, of which 10 are Republicans. So this legislation is something that, that I think all sides of the political spectrum, from uh, solidly liberal to solidly conservative and everything in between, uh, share a certain amount of agreement on. And it used to be the case, sir, that, that 
politics stopped at the water's edge. I, I'm, I fear that is less and less the case. Uh, I hope it is still the case that politics stops at water. And we have an op opportunity to demonstrate that it does here today. Finally, this is an opportunity to save lives. We have already discussed in some detail exactly how many lives we think are being lost every day. But it's not just about the loss of life. It's about the loss of health. It's about the loss of opportunity. It's about the loss of productivity. And it's about the loss of stability. Where there is a lack of water, where there is a scarcity that is being felt, there's an opportunity for people who, who, who offer some sort of hope to come in and, and, and take advantage. And that can be us, or that can be a warlord. That can be us, or it can be uh, a, a faction of Al-Qaeda. That can be us, or it can be China trying to get natural resources. And so if we do not take this opportunity, we leave it for those other entities to take. And I hope that we will make use of this opportunity. I hope that we will not just do the right thing from our perspective, but do the right thing from the perspective of saving literally millions of lives. Thank you very much for your time. Could I uh, invite Dr. Warner and Dr. McGehee and uh, Mr. Nang uh, to comment on the, the last portion of Attorney Paul Steinmeier's remarks uh, and any other comments they would like to uh, add at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I fully agree with the remarks that uh, Mr. Steimer said. It, the, the Water for the World Act is, it's not just about funding, it's not just about loss of life, it's, it's this bigger picture, loss of opportunity, loss of hope. And, and here's where we have an opportunity to, to bring many of these almost intangible benefits to millions of people around the world. They're not things that are quantified in benefit cost equations. They're not something that what can, one can measure with, a, with a, a ruler. But they are things that make a difference in the people's lives and it makes a difference in how they respond to other opportunities in their life. I, to, to see how they can um, take hope from some activity which makes a big change in their life, such as water sanitation, they may have the interest and, and the capacity to do other things. And th that's why this, this act is, is so important as part of, uh, of uh, overall U.S. government uh, international development policies. It, it, it brings water and sanitation, which is uh, the, the cornerstone of of many, many development activities to a point where we can give it more attention, give it more resources, and, and watch the changes that take place. Now, th this is not an easy task, but I it does flow from uh, this key role that the U.S. government can play in moving this field forward. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of what he has said. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. McGehee, please. I want to talk for just a moment uh, to put what was said so well in the context of one of the activities I've been fortunate enough to work on, and that was on in an enormous uh, fruit vegetable market in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We talked earlier about social structures and we talked about technologies and the, the activity that, that we did there was no more difficult, no more technologically difficult than constructing a latrine to serve the market vendors and the customers in this market. What we did with that though is we viewed that, that market and those vendors as the community that was going to own and operate this latrine over time. I did this work in probably 1999. As of 2008, which is the last report that I heard, that latrine is still operating. It's making money 
for the local nonprofit which is running that. It's serving as an educational center for teaching people about simple things like covering the food in your market, washing your hands in the restaurants, and it's a continuing ongoing hygiene education vehicle which we were able to complete for a very small investment of probably less than thirty thousand dollars but it was that time in the u.s government's work when we did those things and i had the opportunity to work with a local ngo to put that that latrine in in place and transform the <laughs> as simple as the market experience, but in some ways that aspect of the lives of those women market vendors in that market for the next eight to 10 years. Those are the kinds of simple things that we know how to do, that we know how to do properly, and that we're handcuffed right now in having the opportunity to do those those simple activities which can address this indefensible negligence of the 5,000 children who are dying from diarrheal diseases today. I, I, I strongly support what was said about politics stopping at the water. I don't see how this can be anything but a nonpartisan issue. And if, I, if you're able to act on the idea that, uh, that uh, Ms. Jackson Lee put forward of moving this forward this week, that would just be a spectacular Christmas present for those of us who have been doing this for the uh, past 25 years. And as separate from that, as a citizen of the country, something that would clearly show the nonpartisan functioning of Congress around this kind of a global issue to address a global crisis and, and begin that, that political and bureaucratic restructuring of foreign development assistance and elevating a topic that we stand for. I think if you go back to one of the things that Senator Durbin said in, in, the, uh, in the video, here's something that we can say, I am an American foreign development professional. I strongly believe in the right of people to clean drinking water and, uh, and, and, and sanitation facilities, and my government is investing accordingly, and we're ready to work with you to address this, this kind of a topic. So I think that it is a non-political thing. I think that it cuts across multiple Millennium Development Goals. It's not another earmark. It's a national commitment to a Millennium Development Goal that we say this is something that we stand for. I'm ready to respond with solvable programs, with well-trained people, and so I hope that you're able to get the information you needed out of this session and move this forward this week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Theoni Nan, uh, what, what are your additional uh, comments I, I totally, at this hearing? I totally agree with Mr. Um, Steimer to what he said, that the water for the World Act is an intelligent strategy uh, that will make our foreign assistance dollars go further and achieve more. Um, according to the United Nations Development Program, Every dollar invested in water and sanitation yields an average economic return of eight U.S. dollars. And in fact, the, the U.N. estimated that meeting the Millennium Development Goal on water will place us roughly 30 percent of the way toward achieving every other Millennium Development Goal. And I think that piece is very, very important. I'd like to yield now to uh, our Subcommittee Chairman Hank Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I said about two hearings ago, Mr. Chairman, uh, which would have been sometimes last week, that uh, I've enjoyed being a uh, member of the Judiciary Committee and being, um, uh, and you being my chairman. And you told me, well, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, we're going away or anything like that. And um, little did I know that uh, 
three or four days before Christmas, we would be having a uh, hearing in judiciary, uh, another hearing, because we had two since the time I made that comment, and um, I did not know that we'd, we'd be, here, here we are a few days before Christmas working on a very important uh, issue. And um, I can say from working on this committee, um, you've taught me so many things that I um, already knew, but you taught them to me in a, in a way that was beyond theoretical, but actual. And uh, one of those things I want to point out is uh, the habit of just fighting until the very last moment, the very last second, with everything that you have, um, never giving up, and uh, always looking for uh, when the next day comes, uh, what can I do to advance uh, humanity and the, the cause of policies that uh, benefit uh, people, not just here in America, but across the world. Uh, so I just want to say how much, uh, again, how much uh, I appreciate your service, how much I deeply respect you, and um, how much uh, value that I have uh, derived from being a, um, a, um, a good student of yours. I've tried to be a good student, and, uh, and I do appreciate uh, your, uh, your work, and uh, I pledge to continue uh, your work uh, with you. Having said that, I will say that, um, how, does anybody know how much money we spend, our government, the United States government spends for uh, bringing or helping nations uh, establish uh, clean water and sanitation? Yes, Dr. Warner. For the past couple of years, the appropriations for um, water supply and sanitation, meaning those that would be directed under the, the uh, uh, Water for the Poor Act, has been about $315 million, which is a, a big improvement over what was the case at the beginning of the decade when there was almost nothing. I think at one point there was $15 million devoted to it one year in appropriation. So it's, it's a major increase, but the total amount is, is very, very small compared to other programs that our government supports. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, $315 million per year, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, some of the drones that, that uh, America uh, employs over in Pakistan and Afghanistan, some of those drones may run a little less than $1,000 a piece, but the, the uh, ones that are most um, effective they are uh, called MQ-9s, also known as Predator B drones. And they are marvelous instruments. They uh, are capable of uh, surveillance, and they can drop uh, bombs, 500-pound bombs, and fire, uh, hellfire cruise missiles which cost about $1.79 million apiece. But a, a fully equipped um, MQ-9 Predator drone, Predator B drone, uh, runs about $22 million per unit. And um, in the fiscal year 11 budget request, uh, 
it is for 48 MQ9s, which is going to, uh, so, it, it, so we use 24 million, 24 MQs uh, in uh, fiscal year 10 budget, which ran us about 487 million. And now we're going for 48 uh, with the cost going up about $2 million per unit. Uh, and we, we're talking about basically around a billion dollars just for uh, 48 Predator drones, just for those drones, not, not to mention the others that uh, run for less than a thousand or those that run between a thousand and, and uh, 20 million because uh, we have all kinds of them. And um, then a total defense budget of uh, uh, for fiscal year 11 of $548.9 billion along with uh, $33 billion additional for contingency operations and $159 billion to uh, fully fund uh, operations in Iran, Iraq and uh, Af Afghanistan. So total of uh, $741.2 billion for one year versus $315 million per year uh, on average uh, that we spend to uh, help nations um, with uh, established drinking and uh, drinking clean, clean water, uh, drinking and uh, uh, sanitation issues. So, you know, one hellfire clue Cruz Mitchell, excuse me, one Predator drone firing off a 500 pound smart bomb, and I don't know how much those bombs cost, uh, and, and firing a, a laser guided missile, a Hellfire missile, um, can do a lot of damage, not just physically, but also to the uh, hearts and minds of uh, the people who may have been uh, mistakenly targeted versus uh, spending $30,000 on, a, uh, on a, uh, a latrine system for a village that establishes goodwill even among the harshest of uh, our adversaries. Something is very wrong. I don't, I don't feel the need to expand your disbelief, but I can't help it. I think of the $315 million from the last year, if I remember the numbers correctly, the amount that went to sub-Saharan Africa was the equivalent of two MQ-9s. Uh, the the other numbers I, that that I was thinking of while you were talking uh, in uh, Afghanistan right now, I I'm providing clean drinking water to 125 people at a cost of about six thousand dollars. In um, uh, I'm working with a group of high school students from Minnesota who raised eighteen thousand dollars of their own funds to put toward the payment of. Uh, a sanitation facility and a water supply in a school, and I think they've actually partnered with with a Dr. Warner's organization. So I I share your disbelief at the disparity, and that the funding under the Senator Paul Simon Water for the Poor Act, the 315 million dollars, is minuscule to the magnitude of the problem. So I appreciate the the comparison that that you did. We can do a lot with those kinds of dollars. Yeah, especially when the um, fiscal year 09 uh, total budget for the U.S. government, 3.5 trillion. And uh, 2011, uh, 
3.69 trillion, trillion. It's mind boggling and uh, And I believe that as significant as the Water for the World Act is, that value only goes up to about $500 billion. So it's still an, an affordable investment in the, in the passage of the Water for the World Act. Every 20 seconds, uh, a child dies from a water-related disease. Every 20 seconds, one child, a little less than uh, 20 seconds, maybe somewhere between 15 and 20 seconds, a child dies. <clears throat> and I just uh, think about how much good we could do with just, uh, instead of allocating for uh, 48 uh, crews, uh, 48 uh, drones, MQ-9s, maybe we, if we try to get by with the 24 that we had for 2010, how much we could do with uh, just another uh, $500 uh, million. Uh, so it's astounding. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Subcommittee Chairman Johnson. Um, we're honored by the presence of the gentleman from California, Dana Rohrbacher, who was an early sponsor of the uh, Paul Simon World Water for the World Act and has been a, a consistent champion of trying to bring uh, the, some of the countries in Africa and, and Haiti, uh, all who have uh, suffered, as we all know, uh, from the lack of clean water and the consequences that flow uh, from that. And I would, with pleasure, yield to him at this time. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, number one, obviously, as a Republican, I sort of don't go along with the dichotomy of we're just talking about missiles versus water. And uh, uh, we just left an era of the last two years where this uh, Congress has allocated hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to American financial elites. So maybe, uh, maybe it's not just maybe we need a weapon over there or maybe we don't. That's debatable. But... Uh, uh, we have to make sure that we aren't wasting money on things. Uh, I mean, uh, I, if, you are, if you happen to have worked for Goldman Sachs, your chances of having uh, a lot of money in your pocket right now that you've received from the federal government in the last two years is highly likely as compared to if you work for the corner drugstore. Will the, will the gentleman yield? Sure. I, I fully uh, <laughs> agree wholeheartedly with what you have just said. Okay, uh, I'll continue <laughs> sipping my uh, uh, cappuccino here, <laughs> which I might add is uh, I am I feel very comfortable in doing this because I know I'm not going to get sick after this, and uh, this and I realize that in this in world today that there's so many people who uh, can't uh, take a sip of something to alleviate their thirst without wor worrying that it's going to cause them to have some problem with their system. Uh, and die or have their children die and uh, I'm sympathetic with that I uh, uh, when I first uh, uh, I remember I gave a speech on this about uh, 20 years ago about the importance of water because uh, I come from a poor family background my parents both came from dirt poor farms in North Dakota and um, <clears throat> my father would take me back there to work he'd less stayed in the Marine Corps and uh, he would talk about the hardships of when he was young, and he, they lived in abject poverty. But he said, if you have a country that has two factors, ordinary people have the chance of living a decent life. And those two factors are energy and water. And uh, 
Uh, without energy and without water, you're going to have wealth sucked away from the standard of living, or you're going to have some uh, a, a real health challenge, uh, especially with the water area. When I gave a speech mentioning that and mentioning how important water was, I happened to get a call, uh, none other, uh, from Senator Simon, who uh, uh, was and had, he had a long conversation with me over the phone and said he had read my entire speech, which was incredible. But, uh, and uh, he mentioned, uh, and I, he sent me his book, which I read, and uh, I found it fascinating, the relationship not only between water and health, but water and peace. Uh, we have a situation now where people, when they look at the West Bank and they look at the uh, how do we find a way to get out of this quagmire between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Water has to be a consideration or it ain't gonna work. And uh, what's happened is we haven't really been looking at that because there is a severe water shortage in that part of the world. The very first uh, uh, incident that caused uh, the 1967 war between Israel and the Arab, its Arab neighbor, neighbors was that Syria began a water project that threatened the water supply of Israel in the Golan areas, and the Israelis bombed that project. And Paul Simon actually pointed that out, I think, in his book. And so had we solved that water problem, maybe there might not have been that war. Maybe there would have been some way earlier on to, to try to find some, some areas of peace. I think prosperity, peace and prosperity depend on water. And water depends on two things, technology, which I'm a senior member of the Science Committee and I have constantly worked on newer technology and continue to focus on that. But it also depends on, and again, this is where it might be a little dichotomy here, and that is uh, it, when you see these lack of water facilities in a lot of these countries, it has a lot to do not with the poverty-stricken nature of the country, but the corrupt nature of its government and the lack of freedom and accountability in their government. Money that should be going for infrastructure goes into the pockets of dictators who then, I might add, put it into Western banks and the Western bankers then uh, put it in their secret accounts and then when the dictator dies, they just envelop all the money into their own uh, coffers. Maybe that's something, Mr. Chairman, we should look into how billions of dollars that we supposedly have given in aid to third world countries have ended up going to Western banks and, and then stayed there. So, Including Haiti. I would imagine. I, uh, I haven't looked at that, but I know several cases in Africa, but certainly I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. So we, in order to accomplish goals like this, I think it means more than just money out of our pocket but it does take ex uh, prioritization of what limited resources we have in an era of such high deficits. It takes uh, a commitment to honesty uh, at, at an international level. We have now made not only, we have made deals with some of the most rotten regimes in the world, and I think we're fighting some of the most rotten regimes in the world as well, but we've also allied with some of those guys. And uh, again, uh, may not be the cost of the bomb, but the cost of, uh, of beefing up the Ethiopian army, for example. Uh, uh, the Ethiopian government stole their last election, used the uh, foreign aid that we gave them in order to buy machine guns to suppress their own people who had elected a more democratic government. That money, instead of going to, to those jeeps with the, with the machine guns on top of it in Ethiopia, should have gone perhaps to a water project in Ethiopia. We know that they have that problem. Uh, I have a question for you, sir. And you mentioned the, uh, uh, how many people you could take care of in terms of the water needs uh, for, was it $6,000? Uh, the, by and large, uh, do you think that, that a project that we should be looking at should be focused on that type of sanitary uh, uh, offensive, you might say, and, and policy or should we be looking at more infrastructure policies that are uh, uh, not maintaining, but are actually trying to uh, create more water in the long run? My personal dream project along that line mm -hmm. is to identify a country and make sure that every school in that country has sanitation facilities for girls and boys and, and, and a drinking water supply. 
those, those sort of fundamental basic infrastructure and accomplishing a task like that would say, here is our footprint. Mm -hmm. We have taken this challenge on and we've knocked it out. And there are plenty of other or organizations that can mobilize the funds for large scale municipal infrastructure, for water treatment plants, for sewage treatment plants. We had a colleague from the World Bank here earlier. The African Development Bank is moving in this direction. Uh, the Asian Development Bank is moving in this direction. JICA uh, from, from uh, Japan moves in that kind of a direction. But to take on this very human problem of the example of schools without facilities to me is criminal neg negligence. It's just I don't understand it. And it's something that we as a country could just step up to. It, it plays to, to our sweet spot and the history that, that, that my colleague Dr. Warner presented earlier about taking on that small scale infrastructure and doing it from beginning to end. When you say doing it beginning to end, and it is yeah. small scale infrastructure, yep. um, but you have to go, I, again, a lot of this is traced back to the fact that you have corrupt dictatorial government. Uh, just to accomplish, can we accomplish a mission like that under the type of dictatorships that we have to operate under their umbrella? I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit and try and answer your question. I'm doing that right now in rural communities in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It's a USAID-funded project. I've been through inspector general reports multiple times. We're accounting for the dollars, we're accounting for the contractors, and we're delivering services. So yes, I think that, that, you, that you can do it with equal attention to how you're functioning, how your finances are running, how your management's are, how your management system is implementing and operating, and what it is that you're delivering in the way that, that you're delivering it. I'm absolutely confident that you can deliver those kinds of services. Well, I would uh, suggest to you that, uh, and Mr. Chairman, his uh, example of Afghanistan is really uh, right on target. I have uh, hiked through that country for the last 30 years, and uh, I will tell you, most people do not understand the relationship between water and peace there. And if we can show our goodwill uh, to many of those villages by providing them with, uh, with clean water, which is a relatively cheap gift as compared to the other things that we're trying to provide, I think that we can buy the goodwill, uh, which is nothing wrong with buying goodwill uh, of people, and then uh, maybe that would help us bring peace to that troubled land, and I think it's an important element. So uh, thank you for your... Uh, and just as a side note, and then I'll let this, uh, I had mentioned earlier that we're on a trajectory with this project to provide clean drinking water to 300,000 people in rural communities in Afghanistan by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. 450,000 people with contracts that are, that are under consideration right now by June of next year and the project is only about 15 months old. So the next and time you go... I and of course you have honest government in Afghanistan. <laughs> and, uh, let the record show that the, uh, the <laughs> that there was laughter at that uh, bit of humor. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Oh, okay. You rightly raised the issue of uh, uh, corruption in government and uh, the effectiveness of small-scale infrastructure. Corruption tends to be easier to um, occur. I mean, it occurs more often when there are huge infrastructure projects mm -hmm. because then these are channeled through the national organs, the Ministry of Finance, various other national agencies before it gets out to the field. And, and um, many of the most egregious examples of corruption in the past have been with large-scale infrastructure projects. I, I'm not speaking against them. I'm just saying that's a fact. But with small-scale projects, this is not so easy to do. I mean, the corruption is not so easy to carry out and keep hidden because uh, small-scale projects, the small-scale infrastructure, tend to be more labor-intensive. They tend to bring the local people into the process. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have more education, more training, more involvement on committees so that they talk over and decide their problems. And very often, small-scale projects are channeled through non-governmental organizations more directly uh, than uh, the, the funding for large-scale projects. So th the matter of scale has a uh, great effect on the uh, uh, opportunities for corruption here. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witness. Mr. Chairman, uh, and I, I feel that I must uh, um, clarify my comments also. I don't want them to be misunderstood uh, because I know that uh, we live in an unsafe world and uh, America must uh, provide uh, the resources uh, to protect itself and to defend itself and to protect uh, its interests around the world. Um, and so we need a strong military. Um, I serve on the Armed Services Committee and do so with great uh, respect for the uh, security needs of this nation. Um, uh, so having said that, I will also say that I have not had much of an opportunity to deal with uh, Representative uh, Rohrbacher uh, during my short four years here, but I am aware of your uh, longtime um, interest in foreign affairs, uh, and, um, and today you speak uh, about some things that I've, I've found that uh, I agree with. And I think that uh, I've always thought that uh, you and I were just uh, poles apart on every issue. Um, but today I've seen that uh, there is some common ground. And, um, and I think as we move away from partisan politics and uh, and move towards actually solving some of the problems that uh, face us as a nation and face the world, uh, that we can do more um, together than we can do uh, fighting each other. And so I look forward to working with you. Mr. Theoni Nang, uh, do you have any comments to add to this conversation uh, with the uh, a senior member of Foreign Affairs who's with us today? I would just uh, reiterate again um, how important this issue is to me and to many, many young people across the world. Um, today, as I spoke about this before you get here, Congressman, that as we're speaking right now, we're losing so many young people at this time. So many people across the world are dying at this point. And um, I personally talked about that I lost my own sister throughout the process. Um, I was lucky to be in the United States of America. That's why every time I have a chance to drink this, I think about those millions of young people that I go to see across Africa and across the world that will never have the chance that I get. So I love this country because it's given me a chance. It's a country that I really care about because it's given me something so much that I can travel the world today to empower young people and to be the voice for those who don't have it. And I'm thankful for that. And thank you for, uh, for what you're doing, guys, every single day to help not change only America but change the world. But to much whom much is given, much is required. The United States is the leader of the world. And we need your leadership in this matter. We need to save the lives of those children that are dying every single day for something that we can do about it. So we count on you to do something about it. So that's just something I wanted to add. And uh, it would be a pleasure for me to see that one day that we pass the house, uh, that I can continue to remember that even though I lost my sister along this process, I, I had a chance to be in front of you to speak on her behalf because she will never have that chance and millions of them like her. So that's all I wanted to say on that. Thank, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask a question um, or a couple of questions. This uh, HR 2030, the Water for the World Act has uh, been passed by the Senate uh, what have I been during the uh, during this oh, okay. session, the one hundred oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. and what is this? The eleven, one hundred and eleven. Yeah. Yes. I'm forgetting now. 
but uh, so we have a few more days left uh, in the 111. Uh, and I know that if it were up to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, we'd be working on the 31st uh, at 1159 uh, at the end of the year, probably all on into the time we get sworn in, which is the 4th, I think, of January. Oh, no, it is the 5th of January. The 5th of January, so and we've so, got that much time to get So we measure. have until 11.59 a.m. of the 5th before. A p.m. Yeah. Of the, of the. Well, it's 11.59 a.m. because at noon on the 5th, oh, uh, okay. we will convene and the oath will be given gotcha. for the 112th. Hmm. So there is a a little more time left. So, so Mr. Chairman, what is it that uh, we can do to, if it's already passed the Senate, and all we have to do is pass it in the House and it has no uh, budgetary uh, ramifications, is that correct? That is correct. What can we do to make this happen? Well, I, I should say to my colleagues, it passed unanimously in the Senate. Uh, and just from our experience, I think we all believe that if it were brought forward, even at this 11th hour, it would pass in the House as well. I, I can't imagine. Usually it's just the reverse. We're trying to get things from the Senate that we've already given them but in this particular instance, they've given us a measure that Paul Simons over a decade ago was working on, uh, and, and, and we're, we're in these, uh, this 11th hour. So our appeal is that, that this be brought up on the calendar for a vote, and, and I, I'm confident that it would be successful. Mr. Chairman, you're the majority. <laughs> we're, we're taking it easy till next month. <laughs> then all of this falls on the Republican leadership. Good luck. <laughs> Could I uh, ask uh, Attorney Paul Steimers if, if he wanted to uh, share with us his reflections on the, the comments and questions raised by the distinguished member from Foreign Affairs from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Rohrabacher. Thank you for joining us, uh, both in your role as, as a senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and uh, the, uh, as a senior member of the Science and Technology Committee. On the wall in the Science and Technology Committee, as you well know, is the proverb, where there is no vision, the people perish. And the people are perishing. We have provided a vision. You have recognized and have for decades promoted that vision. And I think everyone in this room is grateful to you for doing that. And we appreciate your continued efforts uh, in that regard. I agree uh, that this is not an issue, as, as uh, Mr. Johnson, you have agreed, and, and Mr. Rohrabacher, you said to begin with, that this is not an issue of a dichotomy between spending on, on on this kind of intervention and spending anywhere else. It's a question really of, is this kind of intervention effective? Is it efficient? Will it do what we hope it will do? And is that worth doing? And the answers to all of those questions are yes. Uh, so we do have a very brief window of time where we can take advantage of the fact that the Senate succeeded in passing legislation and, and move forward. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing that that time still exists and that something may still be done. Thank you. Let me raise this question uh, for our examination. And this is a question that falls into uh, our colleague from California's area of expertise. Uh, he is, he's been, he's been to, most of, if not all of the places that we're talking about. I, I, I dare say that if, if he saw a list of all of these, 
I, I don't know if there would be any that he could say, I've never been here yet. I guarantee you he has so. <laughs> But uh, this is a question that has to do with the uh, structural adjustment programs that have been uh, created as a result of a debt crisis that hit the developing countries back in the 1980s, Dana. And uh, uh, just roughly it, uh, uh, it, it was created when oil producing countries uh, that had united in, the, in OPEC increased the oil price for additional revenues. And many of these profits were, as you reflected, in, were, were invested in banks in industrialized countries, which in turn lent the money to developing countries to finance their purchase of products from the industrialized countries. Uh, so far, that's, that's the way a, a capitalist system operates. In, in this way, the loans were given to developing countries helped uh, 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 to stimulate other production and private and public instu institutions encouraged the borrowing. Even the World Bank uh, preached the doctrine of debt as a path toward accelerated development. And uh, as a result, huge amounts were borrowed by the political elites in those countries, which were often luxuries or projects or were stolen by corrupt officials Frequently, uh, people selected uh, by, well, sometimes they were selected even by the exiting colonial powers uh, to lead these failed uh, African states. Uh, well, the, the, the whole point of all of this is that, that this structural adjustment program was designed by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and op imposed upon many of these countries as a condition for loans or, or further assistance. And I, I'd like uh, to invite uh, our witnesses uh, to first make any comments about this, uh, and then I'd, I'd like to turn, uh, turn to the distinguished senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. One of, uh, one of the most important meetings to me that's been held in the last year in the water and sanitation sector was organized by UNICEF. And what was particularly important about it, it took place here in Washington, D.C., and, it, and it, it was during the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF. And it brought together, I believe, about a dozen ministers of finance around this issue of sustainable water sanitation and hygiene to make the argument to them that you heard Senator Durbin make in the film about a dollar investment had an $8 return taking the water sanitation hygiene argument, don't talk about health, don't talk about dignity, don't talk about women, to leave all that out, just take it to the bottom line about return on investment. And that's been documented in a thing called the, the Glass Report that was put out by uh, UNICEF. Was it a collaboration with UNDP also, Dennis, do you remember? Okay, so anyway, that's, that's out there. And, and why that to me was a particularly important meeting is because it started to bring into the equation the financial decision makers. If those, I'm speculating now, this is not my field of expertise, but if those financial decision makers 
are burdened by external imposed debt. Couldn't we explore the model of debt for nature swaps in this sector along something of the line of a debt for water sanitation infrastructure swap? Where where you you maintained the the targeted use of that funds transfer, which was done under the debt for nature swap program, and is also done as part of the implementation of the uh, global fund on uh, malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV/AIDS. That again is targeted funds which go to a government. They're not to be used to supplement other governmental activities. They're controlled for the purposes of those funds. So it's an idea. I'm not an economist. I wouldn't. I'm not a financial manager. I never even get called by Goldman Sachs. A but it could be an idea of taking advantage of the debt alleviation for these sort of targeted footprint investments which we know how to do and we know the, s the successes that that would generate. That's just an idea that came to mind. Let's, let me just note that uh, the chairman's uh, uh, scenario uh, that he just offered for discussion of a debt strategy, international debt strategy, leading to uh, uh, just the opposite of what people intended. People intended uh, oh, we're going to have a debt strategy to build infrastructure, which will then improve the uh, life of these people uh, of various countries. What we have done with the debt strategy is enslave people. And what happened, of course, when you have corrupt government put into the equation, uh, the money that's supposed to go to the infrastructure ends up being uh, pilfered away by the corrupt government. And uh, also, and I might add, uh, there is all kinds of evidence that I, and I think that maybe this is something we could look into uh, in that how, many, uh, how much money is being paid by fin international financial institutions directly to the leaders of these countries in order to get them to accept deals that leave their people in debt. And when the dictator or whoever passes away or runs away to live someplace and uh, enjoy uh, the money he squandered from his people, the people remain indebted. Uh, I would suggest that we think about rules like, um, <laughs> for example, uh, uh, if any money is lent to a uh, non-democratic country, that the people of that country have no obligation to repay a debt that has not been, uh, that they had no say because it wasn't a, a representative government. Uh, we should maybe establish that as our policy. And uh, we should also uh, investigate where the money went to. So uh, uh, I will say it's not just, by the way, it's not just infrastructure. We have had financial institutions, uh, international, some of these organizations that have uh, promoted not the peace and benevolence of the world, but instead just the opposite. They make money by loaning dictators money to go to war with their neighbor. And yeah. in the end, <laughs> the people are enslaved uh, to that debt. <clears throat> One last note, and then Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to leave, but uh, when I was uh, 19 years old, uh, I, uh, uh, did, uh, uh, I did some work in Vietnam in uh, uh, 1967. And uh, uh, I left, and when I left, I'd been up in the Central Highlands with the mountain yards for a while. And um, <clears throat> on the plane to get home, I, I went to Bangkok, mm -hmm. and there was a guy from UNICEF, I believe it was. It could have been UNESCO, but I think it was UNICEF. Uh, it was on the plane, an American. And uh, he said, uh, where have you been? And I've been away from home. And he says, well, look, my wife and I have this house in Bangkok. And why don't you come over and my wife will make us a, an American home-cooked meal, which I hadn't had for months. So I said, whoa, all right, how about meatloaf? Oh yeah, my wife makes great meatloaf. So we go all the way over. So we, we land at the airport and he says, well, uh, uh, you can ride in my car. I have a limo. Oh, he had a limo. So he got in his limo and we drove to his house, which is a huge house with a big, it was like it had a you know wall around it, 
And uh, there were guard, it was a guard or something, open up the gate and gatekeepers and, and people keeping the grounds. And then it was a, a, some sort of a guy who opened the door. He must have been a butler or something. And um, hmm, all right. And his wife, he had called her from the airport or something, and she welcomed us there. Uh, I had a buddy with me, another buddy, and so we went in there, and we had meatloaf with this guy around the table, and then he said, oh, you know, there's something missing here. He says, we're running short. Come with me, and he grabs me by the arm. He says, I ran out of whiskey. I'm sorry. I didn't, we're not, wasn't able to offer you a drink. Come out here, and we go into the garage, big garage, lots of these boxes stacked with I, again, it was either UNICEF or, or UNESCO, one of those, I'm sorry, is this one, I was 19 years old. And he says, here, stay here, and help me get this down. We got this box down, and it wooden crates in those days, and he pries it open, and it says on the outside, I think it was UNICEF books. It said children's books, either UNICEF or, or, or on the outside. And as he opens it up, it's filled with whiskey. And that was my very first uh, uh, introduction to the benevolence of a lot of these high-sounding programs. Uh, all of those books, and I can assure you that on the records it showed that he, had, that he had shipped all of these books to Thailand for children's books, but in the boxes were boxes of whiskey, which, uh, now that was my first uh, introduction. So I have been somewhat skeptical, even for benevolent-sounding projects uh, that we can do things. I would prefer, frankly, rather than leaving people under debt and doing international programs on a grand scale, I would prefer the United States government and the, and the people of the United States and sort of incentives for American benevolent organizations themselves to go out and do things directly with people overseas rather than trying to relate to an international bureaucracy that may be being influenced by international right. financial institutions. And uh, I may end up the chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee uh, uh, the next session, and if I do, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna invite you to sit down in my hearing. <laughs> I, I thank you so much, and uh, what, what a, uh, a relevant and pointed uh, tale that you bring uh, from your youth, actually, to, to be able to recall that. And I'm looking forward to working with you in, in the next Congress. I appreciate your support, and I can only join with the late Senator Paul Simon in congratulating you uh, and many other of our colleagues uh, who are on this bill. Thaddeus McCotter from Michigan is his co-sponsor, Judge Ted Poe, who is a member of Judiciary Committee, is a co-sponsor. Uh, Tom Petrie, uh, Linder, Fortenberry, Boozman, and uh, our good mutual friend, Dan Burton of Indiana, the former chairman of the Government Ops Committee. Frank Wolf, Zach Womp is also co-sponsors, and so, uh, and, and then I was uh, pleased to learn that the former chairman of Judiciary Committee, Henry Hyde, uh, has been involved in this uh, uh, to a, a great deal. Henry believed in life. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I uh, turn to Dr. Warner for any of his comments on uh, what we've been discussing uh, Previously, and especially about the uh, the uh, program that was implemented by the IMF and the the World Bank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm afraid I have a, a poor opinion of the structural adjustment programs that have been um, promoted by the international financial institutions over the past 20, 25 years. Usually, uh, to the, to, as far as I know, they require uh, a country to cut back drastically on its expenditures. And what, they no what the country normally does is begin to cut back on social, social expenditures. And that would include uh, things in rural areas that uh, don't produce a lot of uh, direct economic benefits. Water and sanitation is one of those things that 
uh, is often punished in this manner. I'm, I'm not sure what the solution is to countries which are deeply in debt, but I do know that the structural adjustment efforts of the past quarter century have had, at, at very best, a mixed uh, outcome. Um, listening to Mr. Rohrbacher's uh, comments about um, corruption in the international bureaucracy, uh, I grant this happens. Corruption can happen in any organization. Um, I think from my own experience, both, both working with U.S. government agencies, working with U.N. agencies, working with private sector firms, and working with uh, non-governmental organizations, I just feel in my bones that cooperation is necessary. And it's not just cooperation within American institutions. We have to increasingly be more cooperative and more collaborative with other national institutions, other international institutions. I think the world is becoming too complex, too intertwined for us to think we can go it alone. Maybe a half a century we could, but the times have changed. And if, if we want to be influencing not just what happens under our control, but influencing other organizations to adopt some of the principles that we believe in, governance, democracy, uh, improvement of people's living conditions, then we have to step up and work with them not isolate ourselves from them. So I, I would just say I'm, I'm much more a passionate believer in trying to work with international organizations, reform them where we can, but let's not isolate ourselves or isolate them from us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, could I, could I ask uh, our two witnesses, Mr. Nang, uh, we've gone into a, a different aspect of this subject matter of water. Uh, what are your comments that you would add to this discussion? My comment that I will um, <laughs> just add, I just uh, talked about it again, is just the importance of this and the important that, how important it is for the United States uh, to act. And also to, like you just talked about it, we can't go around the world by ourselves anymore. As, uh, the world are looking into what we're doing. We can set the tone for the rest of the world uh, to follow. And for that, I'll just call into you <laughs> and your um, colleagues to really do something about this for those millions of people out there who need us for this issue. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Steimer, uh, Attorney Steimer, uh, do you have any comments about the structural adjustment programs and the role of the International Monetary Foundation and the World Bank uh, in terms of, of how they uh, affect this whole, the people who are the subject of this water deprivation uh, in the African countries in Haiti? Thank you, sir. My own area of experience is not specifically in that uh, regard, however, what we have heard from the other witnesses, I think, lends itself to a couple of key points. Number one, transparency is critical. Number two, oversight is critical. And third, follow-up is critical. And I think that what the Water for the World Act does is it ensures that the, those three principles apply to this area of development. And the more that we can ensure that that takes place, uh, transparency, oversight, follow-up, the better our results are going to be and the less likely we are to have the unintended consequences that have been uh, discussed so far. I want to thank all the witnesses today. Uh, your contributions are invaluable. Uh, we have a statement uh, for the record from Marianne Williamson, uh, who, uh, whose statement will be included in the record and uh, if any uh, 
of you have other materials uh, that you'd like to add uh, to this, please submit them to the committee. And I'll yield now to um, Magistrate uh, Subcommittee Chairman Hank Johnson for the closing comment. Thank you, uh, and once again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And um, fundamental to human life is water. I think that's been pointed out a number of times in a number of different ways, and um, that should be uh, something that America is about. And uh, Chairman, I appreciate you inviting me to this uh, uh, meeting today, uh, I frankly had not been attuned to this fundamental issue of uh, human life, uh, water, and uh, so I pledge to respond to uh, this opportunity and become much more knowledgeable uh, about this issue so that it can be at the forefront of my objectives as a congressman. Uh, as I serve in the future. So thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is probably overlooked and taken for granted, just like we take for granted the water that is mm -hmm. uh, situated on your tables and in front of uh, me as well. We take clean water for granted and we take the ability to go uh, just outside the door and hit the restroom. Uh, we <laughs> seriously take that for granted, not uh, realizing how important it is to our own uh, safety that we have, uh, that we can turn that water from the toilet to the tap. We actually had a technology to, to do that. And so uh, we take all that to for granted and we should not and I will not uh, henceforth. So thank you all for uh, doing what you do and um, special shout out to the law firm, what is it? K&L Gates, sir. K&L Gates, you. Gates, you would think that they were out uh, <coughs> or that you would be out on the clock representing uh, Goldman Sachs or something like that but instead you are here <coughs> Uh, you are here on this particular issue rendering service and that's what lawyers uh, should do also. Uh, that's an important attribute of our uh, profession. So thank you very much for what you do. And young man, um, um, you are a clear example of, uh, of why we need to improve our uh, immigration laws uh, so that uh, people like you uh, are able to become great citizens of America. I don't know if you aspire to become an American citizen or not, but if you did. I am a citizen now. Are you? He is a citizen. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, we need more, we need more, some would disagree, but I'd say we'll, we need more people like you uh, seeking to come to this country. And uh, gentlemen, Ms. Dr. Uh, McGahey and Dr. Warner, uh, you all are uh, sure you could be making a lot more money doing something else, but instead you're doing what you're doing, and uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, Merry Christmas to all. Happy Hanukkah. Happy um, Kwanzaa. Yeah. And uh, everything else. Thank you. Uh, Paul uh, Steinmeier, uh, you indicated in previous discussions that there are some two dozen other nonprofit organizations that are associated uh, with us on this very important cause of water for the world. Could you give us some indication about uh, who they are and where they're located and what they might be doing. Uh, I, I would uh, I would request leave to revise and extend. 
But uh, certainly organizations as diverse as uh, uh, the One Campaign and Population Services International, uh, of course, the, 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 the organizations represented by my colleagues at this table. Um, we've, we, we have uh, the, the Millennium Water Alliance, uh, the Global Water Challenge. Um, it, it really is the, 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 the good people at Rotary uh, International have, have taken on water as the next big challenge after polio. Uh, and I think as, as we all understand, when Rotary decides it's going to do something, uh, it really does something. Uh, so there's, there's, there's just a, a tremendous uh, diversity of organizations that are involved in this, not just, not just on the nonprofit side either. Uh, corporations like Coca-Cola, like Dow, uh, like Levi Strauss are, are also involved. Uh, and then uh, community organizations and religious organizations. So it really is a, a broad spectrum of, of America that is involved in this individually and, and in groups. And uh, to have that reflected and amplified by Congress through the Water for the Poor Act first and now through the Water for the World Act will, will only increase the involvement of Americans uh, overseas. So thank you very much. Could I call on our distinguished colleague, a, a senior member of Congress, uh, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, for the concluding comment uh, of this uh, forum? Mr. Chairman, thank you. I was on the floor debating the Competes Act, uh, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. And I know that these witnesses are on their last end, but I know their commitment as well. So let me bring the two together. The Competes Act is about technology, methodology, science, creation of jobs, uh, innovativeness, uh, and um, there's an irony there. I was championing that cause and uh, saying that America needs to get going. Uh, and that is true. Uh, but when I listen to uh, Dr. McGee, I understand that there is technology that we are not taking advantage of. And as I calculated the numbers, uh, I did not uh, hear from Mr. Uh, Nang his numbers, but I calculated five million over five years, but I then calculated the potential for five to 10 million um, per year. And so that would lead us up to about 75 million, uh, 80 million, and then we keep going. 53 uh, billion, it looks like, in India that doesn't have clean water. So, Mr. Chairman, um, there is no doubt that this room should be standing room only. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on the Foreign Affairs Committee along with this committee, and I say that because you do get a, a sort of a world view, and this water issue is one that has come to our attention, but as you can see, this bill is, doesn't seem to be near passing. So attention is not really what it needs. We need to be on fire. Uh, the World Bank, uh, made the point uh, that sanitation, and so in my closing remarks, Mr. Chairman, I want us to be able to, and if it means that I lift the sanitation heavy lift, that they must go intertwine, uh, because I think uh, the greatest present pox on our house is that all of us went down to Haiti. Uh, I traveled with the chairman. We were some of the first, we were in fact the first delegation there uh, and we thought we were asking all the probative questions. It seemed like the government was trying to give us answers. We interacted with NGOs, and not a one of them, Mr. Chairman, opened their lips about water. We walked through the uh, tent cities, and uh, it looked kind of strange, uh, if I might. Uh, you know, the kind of water that you see that looks colored and heavy and, and problematic. But no one opened their lips. Mr. Nang, I've been to Senegal, and uh, we welcome you for your talents here. Certainly a fellow travel traveler as far as council is concerned, but no one seems to get it. And I frankly believe, as I said, the bill that I'm adding to this journey, the one element, the reason why I'm adding it, because it creates a Bureau for Global uh, Water Aid. And uh, it may have to be ultimately amended to take into account the sanitation, but when you go and see people who are literally dusty because of the lack of water, both in terms of the coloration of their skin, but also because of the 
topography or where they live, the dust, the desert is coloring them as well. We don't seem to get it. And I guess the point that I go back to Haiti is we had an opportunity. We didn't have to be here with cholera. And we were just there. I think, Chairman, we seemed to travel on the same, same boat. We were just there, uh, and we were discussing um, uh, the uh, situation, and they wanted to tell us that it was, uh, you know, it wasn't the, uh, the, the uh, soldiers from Nepal or wherever they were. It was something else, and everybody was pointing the fingers. And it's gotten worse since we left. We have an election that's unsettled. So, Mr. Chairman, I would say that um, we probably don't have enough water in here to douse our hair that's on fire, but I want the record to reflect uh, that we are on fire, and we need to be. Uh, and I think the most uh, descriptive uh, and uh, visual is uh, my good counsel who noted uh, to fill this room and have children standing at the door. They are, have, in essence, those numbers have, in essence, died as we have been speaking here today. Am I accurate? Do um, you want to correct my? Only, only in so far, madam, as there are now three times more. Since we've been here discussing this. Since last you asked the question. Thank you. I'm glad you potently and eloquently framed that for us. So that means as we continue, Mr. Chairman, to go vote on the floor of the House, as some of us get on airplanes, uh, make our way back to our respective districts to interact with our families uh, and, of course, uh, extended loved ones and community. We will lost generation, a football field full of children. Uh, so um, I don't know if we uh, mention this, and I, I don't say this in humor, but uh, if we said for the Senate to just do one more bill uh, procedurally, where would it be? But I do believe it is crucial. Uh, that if we could pass this, if we could bring this up uh, on the House side, uh, it's important. Um, I don't want to talk about delay, but certainly our hair must continue to be raised until we find some permanent solution to providing water where it is needed to provide cleanliness and sanitation and simple life. I thank Mr. Johnson and uh, my colleague, Mr. Cohen, who was here, I know, and Mr. Roenbach, I understand, was in the room as well. So we know this is a bipartisan crisis, and members have uh, the responsibility to act on it. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your leadership and the continued leadership that you will uh, engage with us uh, in uh, 2011 and for the 112th Congress. Thank the witnesses very much for the power of your testimony. I yield back. I thank all of you for being here uh, deeply. Uh, our struggle continues. Uh, the rules of the judiciary of the committee apply in terms of submitting additional uh, information or documents, and the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>